This will be a full analysis of Silent Hill 2, the 2001 horror game for the PlayStation 2, directed by Masashi Suwayama and written by Hiroyuki Owaku. This video will include full spoilers for Silent Hill 2 and Silent Hill 1. I'll be playing on real PS2 hardware with an NTSC version of the game to guarantee the least amount of technical issues possible, since SH2 has been infamously troublesome to port elsewhere without glitches or visual hiccups. Like with my analysis of Silent Hill 1, I'll be assessing the title's quality without relying on external information as much as possible. We'll be looking at how the game holds up purely on its contents alone. We'll also be analyzing the game from an initial release perspective, so we'll only be looking at how the game relates to other games of its time and the previously released title in the series. Silent Hill 2 features a lot of plot points that recontextualize parts of the game, so I apologize if some segments here come off a little too descriptive to start with. But SH2 is a very complex title, and a lot is needed to fully understand it. It will all be in service of further analysis as we get closer to the end of the video. Much like Silent Hill 1, Silent Hill 2 has a cool opening movie, but there's been almost a total inversion of priorities with it. One's opening appeared before the title screen and actually contained some quite crucial information about the title's setup that could be missed if skipped. SH2's opening doesn't, on the flip side it shows probably too much upcoming stuff you shouldn't be seeing yet. On top of that, it's hidden away after a long wait at the title screen. If I had to pick an approach, it would be the first games. Aside from making the opening easier to miss, Silent Hill 2's intro video tries to mitigate its more spoiler-heavy clips by cutting the dialogue from some of them if it's your first time booting up the game, only adding them back in at some later point, definitely by the time the game has been beaten. I still think though you're best off not seeing most of this intro on your first time, unlike the SH1 opening that shows later scenes that are fairly harmless to view early. It's a shame they hid this opening and threw a bunch of important mid-game cutscenes in, because the music that plays over it is probably my favorite track in the series, and also probably my favorite piece by series composer Akira Yamaoka. The track manages to convey both a dark, foreboding vibe while being amped up and actually getting you kind of pumped for the journey ahead. It's an amazing mixture of emotion which is apt for the story that's about to unfold. Unlike Harry Mason in the first game, who charges through Silent Hill so successfully that the local witch lady starts launching him towards monster targets, we're presented with a much more insecure looking protagonist for two. Our new point of view, James Sunderland, has to psych himself up before heading into the foreboding town of Silent Hill, which humanizes him greatly right off the bat. Graphically, Silent Hill 2 takes a stunning step forward on PS2 in terms of its models, environments, and FMVs. It's crazy to think there's only a two-year gap between the release of the first two Silent Hills. An interesting note to make is SH2's addition of a new control scheme. You can trade out the tank controls from the first game where movement was relative to where the character is looking for movement relative to where the camera is looking. It's nice that they added that option, but I'll be sticking to tank controls since they fit better in a game that suddenly switches camera angles on its own a lot. Three years after the death of his wife Mary to an illness, James Sunderland has received a letter from his deceased significant other asking him to come meet her at their special place in Silent Hill, a resort town they're used to vacation to. It becomes pretty clear early on that James hasn't got much going for him anymore or much of a reason to live from his demeanor. A pretty good candidate to delve into a place most of us would probably leave running from. Self-preservation isn't high on this guy's list right now. Is it dangerous? Maybe. And it's not just the fog, either. Okay, it's... I got it. I'll be careful. I'm not lying. No, I believe you. It's just... 
I guess I really don't care if it's dangerous or not. Unlike Harry Mason, his mission here is half-hearted. How could it not be when he knows his wife to be dead? Could Mary really be there? Is she really alive? Waiting for me? He talks about finding his wife, but the way he does is unconvincing. Just a deluded fool kidding himself, not really that convinced there's any hope. I'm looking for someone. Who, who, who is it? Someone very important to me. I'd do anything if I could be with her again. You get the impression at this point he just has nothing much else better to do than follow the trail of a sketchy letter. The game takes a bit of a risk at the start here by having you run through a long and empty path to the town. It serves a good purpose though, I think, to give you a tangible look at how isolated you're gonna be in this place and how far you're leaving the outside world behind to get there. Excuse me, I- <gasps> Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I oh, was just- Oh, it's okay. I didn't mean to scare you. Angela is introduced here and she doesn't seem all there. I thought my father and brother were here, but I can't find them either. Characters in one were a lot more straightforward or keen to figure out what was happening, perhaps eventually turning out to be deceptive, but driven to something. Here though, everyone seems confused and aimless and immediately not at all trustworthy. Motives are sometimes there, but vague and unconvincing. I'm sorry. It's not your no, problem. I, I hope you find them. Yeah, you too. Much like SH1, once in the town, we're left to follow a mysterious figure through the fog, which leads us to an enemy encounter. Unlike one, though, which overwhelmed Harry with dizzying camera angles and an onslaught of monsters, we get one creepy looking enemy to batter with a stick which isn't quite as cool, but it gets the job done. From here, you're allowed to roam around this section of Silent Hill at your leisure before moving on to the first big, self-contained level. You can use this time to collect extra supplies and find a bit of hidden flavor text. From Kaufman's talk in SH1, we can assume the destruction and invasion of the town was a new event and had begun recently, at least as far as that game's context would imply. So it can be extrapolated that SH2 takes place sometime afterwards with the town torn up in disarray and abandoned, since it now also seems to be in a state of considerable further decay. If you explore these early areas a bit, you can even find some corpses of those who have come by recently and didn't fare too well. From reading these notes, we also get an interesting tidbit that these victims were perhaps not seeing the exact same terrors, as well as the tip that enemies have a harder time noticing you if you keep your torch off. A neat feature I neglected to mention in the SH1 video, the trade-off being you can't look at your map or pick up items with the torch off. When in the dark, at least. I like this first little open bit as it's a good place to get to grips with the combat and the map system, which once again helpfully updates itself with important info when you stumble across said info. James suggests the park on the lake might be where Mary would want him to go to find her in Silent Hill, so you have a general idea that you should be heading northwest but once you realize the roads heading over there are cut off, a little bit of worry might set in as you have to now search the streets looking for alternative routes. I think this is a cool way to start off the game, a little bit of disconcerting wandering through the misty town. There are at least three points of interest you can stumble into that can plausibly put you back on the right track to a route through the apartments. So you'll get a little thrill being lost in the town for a moment, but things won't get frustrating early on since you probably won't be out of ideas for long. This first moment of relative self-sufficiency is a good way to get the player acclimated to the fact they'll be rewarded with the right answers when they explore. All the notes you find here have presumably been left behind by now dead explorers of Silent Hill. Contextualizing way markers in horror games by having you collect the notes of past explorers is certainly nothing new, but it's hard to argue with this tried and true method. Giving your brain that little push to imagine who was exploring these places before you, while serving the dual function of helping you know where to go. While graphically Silent Hill 2 is more detailed than 1, James's running animation does come off a bit primitive, even compared to Harry's, and you'll probably be noticing it by now as you wander through town. At first I was gonna flip a tit when it looks like the animation from SH1, where the character would put their hands up when running into a wall had been removed here. But in what I can only describe as an ultimate weirdo move, this animation still exists, but only on high 
hard mode. Don't know why, I don't think it makes the game really much harder, it's just a cool detail which normal lacks now. There are some cool other details though, like James leaving footprints after walking through blood. Of course, in-game facial animation has seen a bump from the bubble heads of the PS1, but the FMV facial animation by Takayoshi Sato is where the real money shots are at. The detailed mouth movement and small facial tells give the characters a believable edge. Combat is basically unchanged, barring the removal of Harry's epic backdash. You'll even be receiving a similar arsenal, pistol, shotgun, and then rifle, with a variety of melee weapons thrown in throughout. Silent Hill 2, once again like 1, presents a more laid-back approach to combat and survival for the genre. There's plenty of health and ammo to come by, crossed with infinite inventory space. And you're given a little more mobility than, say, the first Resident Evils when it comes to keeping your distance from the fairly unpredictable enemies. Some added complexities in the combat system since 1 probably wouldn't have gone amiss though, but Silent Hill by choice remains a horror game more dedicated to guiding you through a horror experience that frightens and enraptures with its visuals, sounds, and level design, rather than being one that forces careful supply management or strategizing about what route to take through the level to avoid as many enemies as possible. Of course, to add to a horror game's sense of peril, death has to be possible, so enemies serve as a plausible threat and a reminder you're being hunted by something. The sound out in the distance could be some unknown tortured design coming to get you that could end your game. Or it could not be and your imagination is getting the better of you. Planting seeds of unease and apprehension is sort of Silent Hill 2's entire trick really when you get down to things. It's a game with such expert environment and sound design that the implication almost suffices alone. The not knowing what might happen is enough here to make the game a significant, scary, trying mental challenge to overcome on your first time through, if nothing else. Just what the game implies could be out there gets those stress gears in your head turning. While the amount of enemy types and the ways it's actually possible to die is fairly low, conversely, the number of details put into each level to put you on edge is of a higher number and a higher quality than most horror games. The claustrophobic hallways of the apartment level starts the game's sound design off strong with a myriad of uncomfortable auditory tension builders. You have the unsettling drone of the backing track, the sounds in the distance, Silence being broken by the pitch of your radio, warning of incoming danger. It was all enough in my first ever playthrough years ago to have me pausing the game to take a minute to recompose. The stress of the level was just too intense. On later playthroughs, once you know the only things that are gonna actually try to kill you before the boss fight are the two enemy types and maybe some bugs, you start to ask yourself why you were so concerned the first time around. And that's not a knock against the game, it's huge praise that on the first time through it can haunt the player to such a degree with only so much actually out to kill James. On a repeat playthrough, Silent Hill 2 almost becomes comfy and cozy. You're more comfortable knowing what's coming, so you can soak it all up and enjoy the detail in the levels and the artistry on display. But on that first time round, the absolutely masterful visuals and sound make the game a real challenge to play, complex and demanding in-depth combat or not. Of course, this is all fairly up for debate depending on your stomach. If you didn't find SH2 scary, then perhaps some resource limitations would have improved things for you. But for me at least, the game was overwhelming enough on my first time that I didn't think it needed item management and further mechanics like that on top to keep me on my toes. Like I said in the Silent Hill 1 video, maybe it would be too overwhelming for the average player to face this level of crushing atmosphere with intense mechanical systems and difficulty on top. It might be cool though, it might be hardcore, it might be worth finishing this video before foreshadowing the later ones. I suppose this is just a long-winded way of me saying that the game is so scary that it doesn't need in-depth survival mechanics like a Resident Evil to make things stressful. Kind of, in part, yeah, but it's more the case that the type of horror Silent Hill is trying to do might be actually kind of incompatible 
compatible with the hardcore survival mechanics of Resident Evil. Silent Hill 2 wants its monsters to be unpredictable and move in uncomfortable ways, to pop out of the darkness in areas of low visibility, and attack out of nowhere with few tells. Something that's scary, but could become frustrating in a game where enemies can also decimate your health in just a couple of attacks, with limited inventory space or even limited saving on top. Now, all this isn't to say that Resident Evil always goes easy on the player with super predictable enemies to suit its more hardcore survival mechanics, or that that balance can even be quantified. And it's totally possible the designers of SH2 perhaps at points leaned on the lower difficulty of their game to not have to think too hard about whether enemies always behave fairly. But I think the design philosophy Silent Hill 2 ended up going with is better suited to the type of world structure and enemy behavior it wants to present to the player. I imagine what a Silent Hill 2 with limited inventory, item boxes, healing item combinations, limited saves would look like. Could complicated inventory management work in a game that spins you around through shifting level design, that messes with the player by changing on a dime and providing loads of points of no return? Rooms disappearing and morphing out of nowhere, getting cut off from items you couldn't pick up due to limited storage or something, could have become maddening. Horror games that best handle ruthless inventory management and storage constrictions work better in a self-contained singular location like Resident Evil's Mansion, and can cause frustration in horror games that jump around a lot and feature big points of no return like Code Veronica. This type of mechanically complex horror also works better if that self-contained area that encompasses most of the game world is relatively compact. Even if Silent Hill 2 didn't feature shifting level design and let you return to older segments, to create the feeling of this big empty town, there's a lot of distance to travel, something that wouldn't be that engaging to backtrack through to collect one third of a health item to slightly up your chances of beating the next boss. The smaller environments in classic Resi make that not so much of a hassle if you really have to do it. Even now, with the generous way the inventory system is devised in Silent Hill 2, it's possible to get stuck in a situation where you don't have enough resources to progress smoothly if you play super sloppy, so imagine if it was trying to be more hardcore. If there's one thing the self-contained levels, these kind of Zelda dungeons, so to speak, do better in SH2 than one, is play with the cast and have more story beats take place throughout them. The apartment complex alone introduces bratty Laura. Mm. Ow! Ha ha. Oafish Eddie. What happened here anyway? Uh, I, I told you, I don't know. I'm not even from this town. And gives us an uncomfortable Angela scene where she contemplates suicide. Oh, it's you. Her quick mood swings make her come across incredibly unstable. If I kept it, I'm not sure what I might do. And I must say, a protagonist trying to calm down the mentally ill isn't something I'm used to seeing much in a video game, let alone in such a serious, grounded context. It's easier just to run. Besides, is what we deserve. No. I'm not like you. The way the SH2 NPCs babble at you gets you wondering what these people are really doing in Silent Hill, and how much they have in common with the hapless tourist you're playing as. She's dead. I don't know why I think she's here. She's dead? Don't worry. I'm not crazy. At least, I don't think so. Another very early clue is dropped when you find your torch. The dress on the mannequin is the same as your wife Mary's. Unless you waited for the opening movie or looked at the photo in your inventory, you might not even notice this, and if you do, you might even brush it off as just some random easter egg or even a reused asset, when really it's the first big hint as to what twist this game will have to set it apart from the first title. The level has a nice touch by introducing the level's boss in gameplay, having the weird pyramid guy just out of reach on the other side of some bars. It's unnerving to find a monster just standing still, fixated on the player, rather than making a grand entrance. Things get a little more dramatic throughout its next appearance, though. 
Once again, Silent Hill 2 disturbs more with its implications than with what you literally see happen. Much like how the environment and the sounds paint a greater picture of danger than the one you stand the chance of actually experiencing at the hands of the various enemy types. There's a similar methodology at play in this cutscene. When it comes down to it, you're not actually experiencing or seeing anything that gratuitous. Just genitalless models rubbing against each other. But your brain fills in all the blanks. The writhing animation does all the work needed to give you the mental picture of what Pyramid Head is doing to the other monsters. The people are acting crazy, the monsters have other urges beyond killing you, and you're in the dark hallways of a building in the middle of a town isolated from the outside world. Also, do you want to stick your hand in this hole in the wall? Yes or no? Most levels have you collecting a series of three major items that will open up a larger section that puts a previous segment permanently behind you. In the apartments, it's on you to find three coins, the puzzle then ensues, being probably one of the trickiest in the game, on normal puzzle mode at least. Harder for me, I'd say, than the piano puzzle, which appeared around the same time in the first title. Some of the frustration, though, here comes from the sloppy interface. You're guessing which slots to put the three coins in, and every time you want to place a coin, you have to select each one from the inventory screen, and then wait for the image of the cabinet to fade in, and then out again so you can put the next coin in. If you want to move a coin, you have to wait for the screen to fade in, have James put the coin back in his pocket and then go through the process all over. You'll have to wait even more if you forget the riddle and need to double back and check the cabinet for it. The piano puzzle setup wasn't ideal either, but having to shuffle around three different items here I think makes it worse. And there wasn't any other puzzle in the game where I felt things could get this fiddly, so it stands out to me. One other moment that stands out poorly in my mind, purely due to how well the issue is avoided elsewhere, is the accessing of room 109 in the apartments. The game won't let you in until you've run into Eddie elsewhere in the building, with the weak lame excuse that some power is holding the door closed. Usually Silent Hill 2 is very good at placing key items alongside cutscenes the game wants you to see, but here the title completely cops out. Using the game's supernatural elements lazily to keep a door shut before we're meant to go in. I know it's more likely a player will see the Eddie cutscene before reaching this door, and the apartment level probably has enough keys as it is, but just placing the key to door 109 alongside the Eddie cutscene would have avoided this contrivance. Again, a type of contrivance the game rarely subjects us to throughout the rest of the game. Angela's in there, but she could have just had another key or locked the door from the inside to be alone for all we know. It's like at the last moment the devs realized the player could miss Eddie's introduction and slapped this excuse in here. The boss of this section is nothing terribly impressive in the gameplay department, and unfortunately the boss fights are going to end up being one of the weaker elements of Silent Hill 2. Even compared to Silent Hill 1, which I think wins out in that department for me purely on how how cool it was to fight the giant bug atop the building and the design of the final boss alone. The small enclosed area and high damage of Pyramid Head's attacks managed to make it a bit of a thrill nonetheless, but there's not that much going on here. The first boss in one had a cooler arena, and at least had a weak point to target when its mouth opened, which was something to consider when timing attacks. Unfortunately for James, the creature doesn't die, but merely grows tired of the battle and leaves. Curious behavior for a Silent Hill monster something to consider as things progress. With the apartment behind us, we have level one, so to speak, completed. Even though the player doesn't actually kill the boss of the level, this is the first part of the game where you're most likely to feel a bit of accomplishment, as you've mastered the fundamentals and overcome one of the game's labyrinths. But this is also where Silent Hill 2 is about to throw its first truly big curveball at the player. It's at this point in SH1 where the player gets a reward for having beaten a sizable chunk of the game in the form of Dahlia. Not giving us the complete truth, but at least some direction on how to take down evil and perhaps save Cheryl. On the other hand, at this similar point, Silent Hill 2 throws in a major curveball that serves to make things far more complicated than they already were. Do I look like your girlfriend? No, my late wife. A big hint that something very different may be up with Silent Hill 2. James hasn't found his wife, but someone who looks almost exactly like her, barring clothing and hairstyle. I can't believe it. You could be her twin. Your face, your voice, just your hair and clothes are different. Her name is Maria. This comes right after Laura makes this comment. You didn't love Mary anyway. Wait! 
do you know Mary's name? How does Laura know Mary, and why is there a woman so similar to her out and about in Silent Hill? We're only one major level into the game, and already the mysteries are piled up so thick. Every cast member we've met so far has a question mark over them, and it's great. Once you get this far in Silent Hill 2, I feel like it's hard not to keep playing to get some answers. The presented mysteries involving the cast are so many, it may be easy to forget to ask who or what is even responsible for these monsters being all around. If there's one thing I think the game could have done better here, it's establish a little more what Mary was like before meeting Maria, so we can better understand the contrast between the two. It probably won't take you long to figure out Maria basically looks and acts like a more promiscuous version of Mary. But so far up to this point, only having been exposed to a bit of narration from Mary and a photo and some FMV shots of her, I think more could have been done to get the player on the same page as James here. This next level gives you the option to explore some new streets if you want before continuing with the story. The incentive isn't as high, I think, as it was earlier. There's just a few supplies scattered about. However, it may be worth making your way up the road towards the historical society just to witness one of the goofiest and dumbest looking parts of the entire game as the town decides to catapult enemies onto the road. The game's lucky this is so easily missable, and I'm sorry if you didn't know about it if I've forever tainted Silent Hill 2 for you a bit by showing it to you. If you're clueless enough to go all the way up to the top of the road for some reason, a corpse weirdly interested in bowling will get you back on track, thankfully. While Eddie doesn't seem all that concerned about the monsters, and Laura seems oblivious to them entirely, James and Maria think it's not the best idea to let a little girl run around Silent Hill, so they chase after after her taking a detour through the CD Heaven's Night Bar. Like Silent Hill 1, it's worth noting how detailed even the most superfluous rooms in Silent Hill 2 are. You'll pass through rooms only one time that feature superbly intricate assets. There's a lot to be said for shorter games that pack in this density of detail. Sometimes they're the kind of games that last longer for me just because I spend more time in each room soaking it all in. Brookhaven Hospital is the second major level. Maria follows you around for parts of this stage, and luckily she's not too much of a burden. She'll stay put in one of the bedrooms for a while, mostly so James can get knocked off a roof by Pyramid Head, which is one of the best scares in the game. <laughs> One of the great things again about Pyramid Head is that he doesn't like to do a big song and dance when he appears. He'll just sort of pop out of nowhere with no announcements, taking you off guard. As for the level, James is lucky the mental patients at this place were all running amok and leaving clues to passcodes around everywhere. In all seriousness though, the hospital is another greatly oppressive environment. Being in a padded cell with a blood written code on the wall is a highlight, and another example of how great the team were at coming up with uniquely uncomfortable, suffocating environments. The music playing in this level ringing out in the form of a discordant respirator is another perfect match. Once you track down Laura, she describes a chronology of events in relation to her interactions with Mary that doesn't seem to line up with James's. I was friends with Mary. We met at the hospital. It was last year. You liar! It's pretty clear the monsters don't seem to want to present themselves to Laura at this point when she locks you in a room for fun with one by accident. A move which didn't endear me terribly much to the character, but I guess as things develop she's gonna come off pretty good against the rest of the cast. This time the boss fight is happening halfway through the level, and this feels weird to say, but this might be the most interesting one in the game from a gameplay perspective. Avoiding two targets that are hooked on the ceiling rather than walking on the ground while getting shots in is a neat switch up. Even even if the confrontation lacks in contextual energy, James being locked into a room where a bunch of feet try to grab him isn't visually that exciting. It's here we get our first world corruption sequence as a more macabre skin covers the hospital. Despite some increased detail, the transformation isn't quite as striking as the ones in Silent Hill 1, lacking some of the vibrance and remaining pretty grey and dull the rustiness less pronounced. The more subdued look the corruption has here serves well as a first step that will build to the level and type of corruption we're going to be seeing later. But the look being less memorable here in the hospital is an unfortunate side effect. 
One of my favorite notes is in this section where a patient describes leaving a ring in the basement's basement and that he'd never go back there. Even though there is no actual danger there, this letter was so ominous it had me walking on eggshells on my visit down. Unfortunately, the Nightmare Hospital includes probably my least favorite part of the whole game, when a cheesy quiz show announcer starts asking you Silent Hill trivia questions. It's not really scary, and if it's trying to be, then it's very tonally out of place compared to the rest of the game's horror. A brother and sister were playing in the road when they were attacked and chopped into pieces with an axe. It's a curveball, but I don't think it pays off. What was the name of the murderer who committed this vile act? It's just corny. Even the characters are kind of like, okay. What was that? Answer correctly and there's some extra supplies in it for you, so at least that's good. James spends most of his interactions in this level with Maria getting completely emasculated. She disses his dead wife and berates him for not looking after her and he just kind of takes it, looking away uncomfortable. Why didn't you try to save me? All you care about is that dead wife of yours. I've never been so scared in my whole life. He can't open this fridge by himself either. Maria, give me a hand here. Come on. You're supposed to be the big man around here. How's a little girl like me supposed to help? Silent Hill 2 wasn't the first game to make you play as a weak everyman. For the adventure puzzle genre, it was even pretty common. However, the lengths SH2 goes to to undermine any kind of video game power fantasy and push James beyond being just an average guy into complete tragic mess is quite significant compared to Silent Hill 1 and a lot of games. James couldn't kill the boss of the first level and the helpless NPC he's supposed to be escorting keeps criticizing him and is needed to open a fridge door. Though the purpose Maria's demeaning of James specifically serves, outside of making you feel significantly ill-equipped to be in Silent Hill of all places playing as such a weak-willed guy, is yet to be fully revealed. You're supposed to take care of me! After collecting a ring in the basement and the fridge, Pyramid Head rears his pyramid head again and chases you down, murdering Maria. James is, tragically, completely powerless to stop another woman from dying, and the piano track that plays after is just beautifully haunting. A combination of sadness for what just happened with a bittersweet, warm reassurance that you're in a safer place. For a game that can be so visceral and loud on a visual and auditory level, the quiet moments lend Silent Hill 2 an excellent sensory ebb and flow. The carnage and noise can be sucked away in a split second and you're left spun around unsure of how to feel, which is what makes SH2 one of the most emotionally draining, yet satisfying horror games. This will be our final jaunt into the streets of Silent Hill. There's a little backtracking into the earlier sections as you follow the directions of, I assume, a doctor. He tells you where his patient hid the key to the historical society. Weirdly, this letter is addressed directly to James, implying somebody has been watching and helping him out here. The author hinting that the historical society is going to have some significance when it comes to delving deeper into the horrors of the town, which turns out to be accurate. Was it the hospital's director, this guy who left these? I don't think there's any explanation for this, but the fact that it's got me paranoid I'm being tracked means it was probably worth addressing this note directly to James. Another, this time optional message, can be found back at the bar from the start of the game, taunting James. There's something especially unnerving about finding something like this when it's entirely optional. You've gone somewhere you have no reason to go to at that point, and the game has still popped up there to creep you out. Nowhere feels safe. James has been getting a lot of judgment from people is what we deserve and the big monster chasing him being on a painting called misty day remains of the judgment is starting to literally paint the picture that something is up with this sunderland guy in a way it just wasn't with harry mason feels like there's something we're not being told the historical society is the most abstract level of the game and probably the most memorable 
The start sets the tone to follow with a descent deep underground down a passage that doesn't seem like it should be there at all. Here we immediately get one of the cooler spooks. James's torch battery goes out in an enclosed room. Putting in a new battery picked up in the hospital reveals the room is covered in bugs once the light switch is back on. While taking damage, you have to frantically figure out what the combination for the door lock is. The cleaner numbers being the ones that form the three-digit code. It's a pretty neat moment, and it's cool to have a hectic survival situation with real consequences to the player character be this effective without even the use of combat. James jumps down a lot of holes in this level. I suppose this is to show that we're entering a distorted reality where the laws of physical space don't really apply. And it really does give the sections to come this uncomfortable sense that they're deeply isolated. But it also keenly shows what a weird frame of mind James is in to where he'd just jump down these things, confused and reckless. I guess you could say we're both literally and figuratively descending into madness. Speaking of irrational, Eddie seems to have totally lost it by this point. Killing a person ain't no big deal. Just put the gun to their head, pow. Corpses being suspiciously nearby when you meet him probably wasn't going to bode well, admittedly. The animation here where Eddie muses about killing is excellent and makes the scene very memorable. But the cunning back and forth between pre-rendered FMV and in-game graphics is especially jarring this time. Starting a scene with an FMV and then transitioning to in-game graphics for the rest, or cutting to an FMV a single time during a scene, isn't such a big deal. But switching four times in just one scene feels a bit off, especially when it's just two guys talking, and there's no intricate action that might justify a diverse range of presentations. I don't know what led to this scene being structured that way, though it is kind of charming, I guess. It's not the kind of thing you'd likely see anymore today. This underground prison section is the exploratory bulk of the historical society level, being sandwiched between two fairly linear sequences. The mood here is probably the most oppressive yet, the room with the word ritual being blasted at you being one of the most unnerving. The various cells here having different designs to reflect their prisoner is a great touch too. Silent Hill 2 is pretty light on jump scares, using your imagination against you rather than relying on startles to make you feel uncomfortable. Probably the only serious major one happens here and I'll never forget how hard it got me on my first time. It's so expertly timed, and in an otherwise uneventful moment, it's pretty perfect. Usually, you expect to open something like a bathroom stall in a horror game and find something horrific in it. So the perfect time to catch you off guard is when you assume nothing is amiss and choose to leave. After that, on my first playthrough, you couldn't have got me out of that bathroom faster. Another moment that caught me by surprise was the horrible scream heard when you put the three tablets onto the gallows. <laughs> Nothing attacks you in this room, all there is is silence, the occasional bout of what sounds like hoof noises, some nooses, and a horrible scream, and still I didn't want to spend a second more in there. Silent Hill 2 is like knowing there's nothing in your seldom used basement in your own house, but if you go down there at night, you still want to leave to the comfiness of the rest of your home pretty quick. A horseshoe, a wax doll, and a lighter must be combined to open the exit hatch out of here. The combination sounds especially silly when said out loud, but the level isn't too big and your options here not too vast, so I'd say it isn't too hard to figure out once you've collected all the items around here. James continues his descent underground through a series of tunnels. There's this rotating box that has to be used to shift the room in front of you to progress. I can't really say the puzzle was a success since I ended up just guessing the answer by chance in all of my playthroughs for this video. But it's inoffensive enough, I guess. What follows is likely one of Silent Hill 2's best scenes, so brace yourself because it's going to take a while to look at every facet of it. Maria is alive, not just alive, but acting as if her death had never happened. Stabbed me? What do you mean? The things she's saying also seem completely off. Up until her skewering by Pyramid Head, Maria was cheeky and sometimes abrasive, but acted like a character in her own right, being afraid or concerned where appropriate. You said you took everything. But you forgot that videotape we made. I wonder if it's still there. How do you know about that? Maria is now acting out things James's dead wife Mary might say before trying to seduce him in the middle of this underground labyrinth crawling with monsters. It doesn't matter who I am. 
I'm here for you, James. See? I'm real. The two are separated by bars, and by the time the player gets over to the other side, through the maze, Maria is dead again. So, you're Maria? I am. If you want me to be. James is being taunted by a sexy, outgoing, promiscuous version of his dead wife, and seemingly being denied her. The imagery in this scene is hard to forget. Despite the dark implications, it's done in such a tasteful way. It's morbid, unnerving, and confusing, but weirdly beautiful in its framing and composition. Like many moments in Silent Hill, though, it's possible we may have to thank David Lynch for a bit of the inspiration here. If you're familiar with the director's work, you may remember a certain scene from a certain show he created, where a character called James receives sexual advances from a woman on the other side of cell bars. I think this is a pretty good moment to bring up voice acting in Silent Hill 2. Angela and Eddie have so far proven to be considerably unstable, and while James displays a bit more lucidity, he's clearly got some problems too. When these adults talk, it can come off as a bit awkward and stilted, like they're confused as to what they're saying. At a very quick glance, this could be misinterpreted as a happy accident due to amateur or lazy direction. But it's this scene with Maria that fully cements and makes it totally clear how that isn't the case and how deliberate all the acting in Silent Hill 2 actually is. Maria is playing the part of a charismatic seducer here and when she does, she sounds completely natural, unlike when the other adults talk to each other. See? I'm real. There's nothing awkward about her. All the performances that sound a bit off are coming out of people who are mentally unstable or confused. I was confused. Where are you going? I'm looking for Mary. Have you seen her? How is a guy who follows the instructions of a letter sent from his dead wife supposed to sound? Even then, there's subtleties between the mentally ill or confused members of the cast. Eddie leans more into dim wit and obliviousness before and after cracking, and Angela talks in a pained way that implies past trauma. James sounds confused, but not as mentally perturbed as the other two. He reacts with considerably realistic emotion and discomfort in the scenes that he's in. I don't know what you're planning, but... There's always another way. The scenes where he's the most awkward are the ones where he's trying to reason or console those far more gone than him. He's doing his best to understand them and displays more lucidity, but at the same time it comes across clearly that he's dealing with a significant mental toll of his own. After the cell scene, you'll have to navigate a small maze where, without warning, Pyramid Head can just show up stalking the halls. This is the one time he's just out in the environment on patrol wandering around, and seeing him just strolling about is a real shock. You can also nab his giant knife down here, which deals immense damage with the trade-off of slow movement when it's equipped. Of course, if James is always carrying this thing, then surely he'd always be walking slow, but we'll let inventory magic slide for what is essentially a cool bonus item. Angela clocks in with another scene where she has to be saved from a new monster. She really seems to have James pegged for a bad dude, but I don't think it's ever made exactly clear why she thinks she knows about James's past. You said your wife Mary was dead, right? Yes. She was ill. Liar! I know about you. You didn't want her around anymore. You probably found someone else! Maybe the town has fed us some memos. After this Angela scene, we get the Hanged Man puzzle, which is a neat, grisly little riddle to solve. But the punishment for failed guesses being a few monsters spawning in feels a bit hackneyed, especially when they're still the same basic monsters we've been seeing since the very start of the game. This gotcha leans less towards Silent Hill being an incomprehensible force of terror, and more towards it being some kind of twisted game show, which I think is much more corny. I'd probably be more critical, but since they literally included a twisted game show segment earlier, I won't harp on too much about this. James stumbles into a graveyard with three empty holes. One of the field tombs belongs to Walter Sullivan, a child murderer you can read a memo about earlier in the game. Another has the name of someone branded a traitor. The three empty holes have James's, Eddie's, and Angela's names written on them. Angela's surname is similar to that of a man killed in a crime of passion referenced in a discarded news article lying around earlier. This hints at her killing a male family member, probably her father. Daddy. Likely due to suffering abuse at his hand. You're trying to be nice to me, right? I know what you're up to. It's always the same. You're only after one thing. No, that's not true at all. 
You don't have to lie. Go ahead and say it. Or you could just force me. Beat me up like... He always did. Eddie, who appears closely after, admits to killing a dog and crippling a football player as retaliation for being bullied. Yeah, I killed that dog. It was fun. Then he came after me. I shot him too, right in the leg. He's gonna have a hard time playing football on what's left of that knee. The graveyard has graves marked with the names of people who have committed some kind of terrible act, and Angela and Eddie have committed a dark crime of passion as far as we can tell, and have their names waiting on empty graves. But as we can see, it's three characters who have a grave waiting for them here. Eddie snaps and turns on James. The boss fight that ensues is once again lacking, though. The awkward back and forth the monsters in SH2 exhibit when attacking James is fine. They're weirdo monsters. If anything, it makes them feel more unreal and scary. Eddie is a person, though, and having James fight him looks awkward as the two chip damage off each other with guns at point-blank range. The Sybil fight in one suffered from this to a lesser extent, since the more primitive PS1 visuals let you use your imagination a bit more to fill in the blanks, smudging the literal events happening on screen a bit in your mind. SH2 is a bit too graphically detailed for this, though. You can't help but think that's not how two guys having a gunfight would look, even in Silent Hill. Sybil also acted like a zombie, being controlled by a bug parasite. Eddie is crazy, but I doubt he'd try and fight a guy aiming a gun at him with such awkward manicking s kung fu, even if he has gone a bit off kilter, while also somehow conversely having faster reload skills than Revolver Ocelot. Also, you know, I can't hate on Sybil. Look at all the cute stuff she does when possessed. Anyway. To climax the mindbender that is the historical society, after descending what felt like miles, the next door has a submerged at ground level, not that far from the main road. While the layout of the historical society, the prison, and the labyrinth is definitely surprising and visually impressive, on a gameplay level, I don't know if it's quite as interesting as navigating the nonsensical nowhere level from SH1. That final stage presented to the player with an impossible room layout, but actually asked of the player to learn that impossible layout out while exploring and solving puzzles. With no map, not that one could have even been drawn with doors that move you between floors and rooms that should physically overlap with each other but don't. A level where if you forget the layout and go back into a certain room that you already got the important item in, three nurses just descend on you to make you regret that mistake. I love the subterranean crushing feeling jumping down all the holes gives you in the historical society level. But to add a bit of gameplay to this contextual quirk, perhaps there could have been other holes that take you to seemingly nonsensical places or elevations. Holes you go down that instead take you back up, and you'd have to actually learn the layout of a level where the basic concepts of up and down don't apply. Just a little idea, perhaps not a great one, but basically what I'm trying to say is that the historical society stage is more focused on using its quirky structure for one-off tricks, the odd quick puzzle, and some shocking moments, than for any kind of serious navigational challenge associated with the level's distortion of physical space. Yeah, you do have to explore in isolated parts, like the prison section and the granted kind of tricky surreal little maze segment, but that stuff takes place between the world-bending transitions, so to speak. Perhaps exploration and world-bending could have come together more like in the Nowhere level from 1. Isolated sections, like the prison and the maze, may take place inside this never-ending descent of impossible caverns, the most abstract location in the game, but they don't actually offer exploratory gameplay that dissimilar from a segment located anywhere else in the game, or offer exploratory complexities that couldn't have been perhaps achieved anywhere else in the game. Game. The abstract layout it has is used more just for the purpose of spooky set dressing. It's a good thing it's probably the best set dressing in the business, so it's hard to complain. Instead of going back into the streets, a boat ride serves as the interlude between the third and final level. This segment can get confusing. Your only point of reference is the light in the distance, and when that's off screen, it can be very hard to tell in which direction the boat is moving. Though maybe that's the point. I'm not a terribly big fan of moving a boat down an empty patch of water either way, but at least it sets an ominous mood before the finale. James meets Laura in the hotel, who presents us with more contradictory evidence. She was in contact with Mary, supposedly less than three years ago, and during that time, James's wife showed some interest in adopting her, a plan that was never seen through due to the terminal illness. I turned eight last week. So, 
Mary couldn't have died three years ago. The hotel level is one of the shorter segments of the game, with no real riddles to solve, but it's home to some good frights. One of my favorites came at the hands of the employee lift, which emits a startlingly loud alarm sound that pierces the silence of the room. Then you see the warning on the side that the lift only admits one person at a time. It's safe to say on my first playthrough I darted out of the lift immediately like nobody's business. It turns out the weight limit alarm goes off not because there's something on there with you like I assumed, but because James is carrying too much weight. All his equipment has to be deposited in a nearby locker to use the lift. I'm not sure you're supposed to even assume there was something with you on the lift, but that didn't stop it from being one of the most intensely terrifying moments of the game. Intentional or not. Not. Forcing you to explore the bottom of the hotel with no weaponry is a simple trick, but an effective one. It was one of the neater moments in Code Veronica, and here it feels even more potent so late into the game, even though you won't actually have to deal with many enemies. One of my favorite touches is that when you head back to collect your stuff, there's enemies outside the room with the locker. Once you get your items and come back outside, the enemies are gone though, denying you any payback. There are some other neat spooks here too worth mentioning. If you try to go to the third floor, you'll be greeted by a grate. Upon leaving, Mary calling out James's name can be heard. James. A whimper is audible near room 208. 208 being the same number as the one on the door to the cell room, Maria has her second death in. What's impressive about Silent Hill 2 is the amount of effort put into these small, unique scares. Instead of creating a level, turning off the lights, and then throwing in some monsters to roam about to do the rest of the work and make things scary, a lot of effort is put into creating uniquely hair-raising one-off moments. It's part of what makes the game so compelling, the experience doesn't get repetitive. Even if the enemy types might. The room James and Mary stayed in when they visited Silent Hill contrasts a lot with the rest of the game. It's the one room to feature intense bright lights, giving it an ethereal and otherworldly vibe all its own. The main twist of the game is about to be revealed here, so if you watched all this way, even though you haven't played, here's your last chance to leave before having everything entirely spoiled. It's here the penny drops and James finally comes face to face with the truth. His wife didn't die of the illness, but was killed by him with a pillow while she was bedridden. Having the happy memories of James's time on holiday with Mary get overwritten by her murder at his own hand, and that being the way this is all revealed is especially twisted. It's at this point James's confused demeanor throughout the whole game starts to come into focus. She died because she was sick? No. I killed her. Mary didn't die three years ago, she must have died fairly recently at the hands of James. And James, unable to accept what he's done, has stumbled into Silent Hill dazed by some form of self-imposed psychosomatic amnesia. A lot of the game starts clicking into place, and one of my favorite, best executed moments occurs. The environment shifts into a damp, decaying facsimile of the hotel while a droning, dizzying track plays. It's like the revelation that he killed his wife has put James in such a stupor that the environment itself is decaying at the same rate as his state of mind. The music here is brilliant and sounds like the world's biggest droning headache. Even the environment starts to make no sense here, as James will enter rooms and appear out of them in completely nonsensical places. It gives this sense that James is stumbling blindly around after receiving the biggest blow of the game. This quote-unquote damp alternative to the rust nightmare from one is, I think, perhaps why the decay present in the nightmare hospital was slightly less intense than here, or those more rusty levels in the original. We get a shift in environment style alongside James's state of mind, less pronounced decay covered up, obscured, and plastered over when things were still unraveling in the nightmare version of the hospital, while the nightmare version of the hotel, now the truth is out in full, is completely falling apart, with no attempt to hide or prevent it in sight. A lesser in one has been through so much, by the time Harry shows up, it's no wonder her nightmare is always on full intensity when it manifests. This segment post the big reveal is just an awesome moment, and a lot of the emotion is conveyed just by moving around the environment, which is 
great too. In general, Silent Hill 2 does an excellent job at conveying James's state of mind through music. Similarly, after Maria's death back in the underground maze, the music from the cutscene continues on after you leave, indicating the event is still raw in James's mind. <laughs> During this final level, the letter from Mary also starts to disappear from your inventory, showing it was either some kind of delusion or created by the power of the town to lure James in. James can recall a conversation here he had with Mary's doctor, who states she would have up to three years max to live. How long does she have? I'm afraid I'm not sure. Three years at most. At the start of the game, James thought Mary died three years ago, and now we know via Laura that couldn't have been the case. Perhaps James tricked himself into thinking the day he heard of this news was the day Mary truly died, as their relationship would go on to never be the same again after that point. Before we can get closure on James's story, we get one last scene with Angela. It's crystal clear now that Eddie, Angela, and James are all tragic characters who committed a terrible act of passion, and the town of Silent Hill is bubbling up their trauma in a physical way. Here we have the most obvious example of two characters' manifested nightmare worlds overlapping. James's world is in a state of damp, wet corrosion, while Angela's is permanently burning. For me, it's always like this. Much like Angela's demeanor, the fire repels you if you even try to get close to her. The execution of Angela's story, I think, is one of the game's biggest successes. It presents us with a deeply troubled and abused character trying to find herself, tragedy after tragedy. But rather than how games sometimes present characters with traumatic pasts as maybe slightly abrasive, moody, or hardened by the dark secrets they have to hide, the effects of Angela's trauma are always on display for you to see. It comes out blunt and uncomfortable in every scene with her. She's tragic, but her situation has made her repellent and unlikable. It's easy to feel repelled by her and feel like you want to avoid her, while simultaneously feeling bad that that's your gut reaction to being around such an unfortunate sick person. Or maybe you think you can save me. Will you love me? Take care of me? Heal all my pain. Someone easy to empathize with, but who you want little to do with long term. Something that, as we'll come to see, ties in quite nicely with James's own story. That's what I thought. In a broader sense, though, it's a tough look at the fact that a person with deep trauma that manifests in repellent ways is going to be pitied by a lot of people, but helped meaningfully and in the long term by very few. Ultimately, there's no uplifting recovery to be found here either. Angela becomes an example of how prolonged emotional and physical damage and severe trauma can't be easily healed, and perhaps sometimes be unrepairable as she walks off into the flames, no hope in sight. It's one of the most adult takes on a character like this I think I've seen in a game. While Angela walks into the flames, it's unclear what her ultimate fate is. The slice we get to see of her journey proving to be a bleak but honest snippet of the big picture. It's worth noting, too, that the US release of Silent Hill 2 features only Angela on the cover. In hindsight, having a physically and sexually abused teen contemplating suicide as the box art for your title is probably one of the most confident moves in game marketing I've seen, and the fact they pulled that part of the story off so well to me says they definitely earned the right to lead with such a strong image. Eddie's and Angela's stories end up being important inclusions that we can use to compare and contrast with James's, showing the results of what traumatic experiences can do to people. Eddie snaps and Angela loses all hope. Now all we have left is to see what road James goes down. Before entering the last section, there's one final save point that has nine save squares instead of one, and I've always found this a really striking image. In general, I find the save squares pretty cool, and James's reflection in them is a haunting little addition to even the very mechanical process of saving your game. James is once again forced to watch Maria get killed by Pyramid Head, which there are two of now. If Pyramid Head represents judgment, it's natural there would be two, since James now has two human deaths on his kill count. Aware of his sin now and feeling sufficiently punished by Silent Hill's horrors, James stands up to the creatures. I was weak. That's why I needed you. I needed someone to punish me for my sins. But that's all over now. 
I know the truth. Now it's time to end this. He can't actually kill them, but by showing a willingness to survive, the creatures cease to have a function and kill themselves. They're a product of James's desire for punishment, so now he doesn't need them anymore. The boss fight itself is nothing terribly special though, with it being the usual case of backing into a corner and shooting before the boss has come over and try and skewer you. But the gravity of the scene is enough to make it exhilarating to land one last smackdown on Pyramid Head. In the next hallway, James recalls some of the verbal abuse Mary would throw at him through the course of her disease. What do you want, James? I, uh, I brought you some flowers. Flowers? I don't want any damn flowers. Just go home already. The delivery here again illustrates just how natural the acting sounds in SH2 when it's not deliberately trying to convey the awkward interactions of mentally ill people lost in a monster town. I don't deserve flowers. Between the disease and the drugs, I look like a monster. Well, what are you looking at? Get the hell out of here! Leave me alone already! Hearing Mary's pain as she takes out her frustration on James while then begging him to stay with her is a sobering example of what it must have been like to live with her for the years she was dying. James, wait, please don't go, stay with me. Putting into perspective how mentally beaten down James must have been after being subjected to this for so long. And now it's time for the great scene where James gets to confess to Mary how he really felt as she was dying, and why he did what he did. Except it isn't, because first we have to fight the final boss. Yeah, you remember, right? The final boss of Silent Hill 2? The one where Maria, now fully masquerading as Mary, quickly snaps into a caged witch monster and comes at you with her evil army of JPEG moths. Mary? When will you ever stop making that mistake? Mary is dead. You killed her. Maria? But I get ahead of myself. At this point, it can be deduced that Maria is some kind of entity conjured by the town from James's subconscious to taunt him with a more ideal version of Mary, a fantasy the town can then undermine for him, especially by killing her over and over. Once James finally rejects Maria here, though, she loses it and turns into a monster. No! I won't let you! Unfortunately, the encounter doesn't hit the mark, and ruins the moment a bit for me. I feel like this fight is frankly kinda tacky, and so out of place, it's like I wipe it from my mind every time I play. Everyone remembers the Pyramid Heads fight and the confession scene, but it's like we all try to forget this weird interlude is even here, cause it's pretty bad. It's like the feet fight from the hospital, but in a much bigger environment with only one enemy to keep track of, so it doesn't even pose some of the frantic action of that earlier encounter. Plus, it lacks the ominous low visibility afforded to that fight, looking kinda goofy with the monster in question out in the open sliding about. While I see the appeal of a hype showdown with a monstrous Maria, Silent Hill 2 just doesn't seem up to the task of creating a non-awkward boss fight, and while I usually roll my eyes hard when a game that predominantly features combat thinks it's above having a final boss, maybe that would have been for the best if this janky spectacle was all that could be thrown together. I think the last Pyramid Head fight with a bit more complexity added on could have served as a decent final boss on its own, to be honest. What's here as the final battle feels rushed. Forgive me. The last few scenes are perfectly executed, though. I told you that I wanted to die, James. I wanted the pain to end. That's why I did it, honey. I just couldn't watch you suffer. No. That's not true. You also said you didn't want to die. The truth is, I hated you. I wanted you out of the way. I wanted my life back. James, if that were true, then why do you look so sad? James confesses he didn't want to see Mary suffer anymore, but also knows there was a selfish aspect to euthanizing his wife. He couldn't bear to spend another day living under the constant emotional weight of her attacks, as well as being unable to move forward in life while in the limbo of Mary's disease. Maria's final heartbreaking letter apologizes for the burden she placed on James and thanks him for all the good times they shared. I am so sorry for what I did to you. Did to us. 
you've given me so much, and I haven't been able to return a single thing. James leaves Silent Hill with Laura, likely fulfilling Mary's last wishes of adopting the child and for him to continue living his life. It's an emotional and blunt ending. Mary's letter being described over dead silence gives it the weight it deserves. Real, believable emotion put into every line. It's impossible not to question what James did, but it's easy to see what drove him to it. The tragedy is palpable. The ambiguity of it all matches the bittersweetness present here, and I guess present for the entirety of the game in retrospect. Beauty and horror, Silent Hill in a nutshell. James, you made me happy. What I've just described is one of the multiple endings Silent Hill 2 has, the leave ending, and to me it's the one that makes the most sense within the context of the rest of the game. James stands up to his judgement monster and it makes sense he'd reject the quote-unquote ideal alternative to his wife Silent Hill presented him with. Maria, it's you. But I don't need you anymore. Considering the mixed reaction he had during her advances. At first I wondered if Maria was supposed to be a manifestation of an ideal version of James's wife, why does she still demean him outside of the jail scene? Other than to add caveats to James's fantasy woman so the town has yet another avenue to torment him with, I think she's meant to let us experience the headspace James was in during the years he was subjected to Mary's mood swings as she was dying. Back then he probably fantasized about the ideal version of his wife he wished he could have, while constantly having his actual wife taking her anger and frustration out on him. Maria lets us in on both sides of this experience, this amalgamation of lusting while getting berated. Maybe on some level James knows he doesn't deserve that ideal woman, so he still gets one whose anger and frustrations bubble to the surface. She then also dies, continuing to mirror the experience James had with his dying wife. Maria is also killed by Pyramid Head, no less, the creature that reflects James and his desires the most. Which makes sense when ultimately James was the one who killed his wife. The fact that the bulk of the time you spend with Maria is in a hospital alludes to those three years of watching Mary die even more, since James would have likely spent a lot of time in one with her. The prison scene is probably trying to add more context to the frame of mind James was in during that period. Locked in, unable to move forward in life, with the image of what he wants unreachable on the other side of bars. Once he makes it to the other side, it turns out there's nothing there but more pain. Ultimately, James rejecting the emotional pit of this self-indulgent fantasy in Maria and finding a reason to live through something positive, like raising Laura, as part of his wife's final wish, nets him the most positive outcome. I'm different than Mary. How can you throw me away? I understand now. It's time to end this nightmare. If I could change the order of events for the leave ending, I'd probably place the final Pyramid Head fight after James's confession, but perhaps before hearing her final message and apology. As I think it would make more sense for James to challenge his self-hatred after resolving his issues with Mary. The second most plausible ending, I guess, is the Maria ending. James tells his judges to do one, however he accepts his replacement, Silent Hill wife. As punishment for this, though, he seems destined to repeat the same horrors as before. Since the last we see of her, she's continuing to exhibit an illness hinted at earlier, presumably the same one as Mary's. <coughs> You'd better do something about that cough. He gives in to his fantasy, but in the long run, this will probably only produce some fleeting happiness before leading back into pain. This is the one ending where some form of Mary herself appears as the final boss, rather than Maria pretending to be her. You must have hated me. That's why you got rid of me. In the leave ending, James works through his baggage with Mary by earnestly admitting fault, while in the Maria ending, any fault has to be pried out of him. You killed me. I couldn't watch you suffer. Don't make excuses, James. <laughs> I know I was a burden on you. It's true. I may have had some of those feelings. He meekly admits to some before running into the arms of Maria, failing to learn from the low, craving some superior fantasy version of Mary led him to before. It was a long three years. I was...
That's why you needed this Maria person? You can see this either as him continuing to wallow in the fantasies he had while Mary was dying and not moving on, or him reaching out for a new relationship that's just too similar to the last. Ignoring all the signs that being with Maria has all the negative dimensions of the Mary relationship as it drew to a close, and that he's just destined to repeat history like this. Trying to optimize what didn't work before and already sunk him, rather than dealing with the past and moving on to find a new purpose. He's just gonna get sunk again. Plus, taking home what probably amounts to a Silent Hill monster in a skirt seems like a bad move. James does sound pretty crazy in this ending, so his demeanor reflects that. It's okay. I have you. The only other ending that can be achieved on a first playthrough is the In Water ending, where James can't bear to live without Mary and kills himself. Now we can be together. It's one of the darkest endings and does sound like something the character could be in a frame of mind to do, but given his standing up to Pyramid Head and a lot of his actions throughout the game nearing the end, it seems like the least likely to me. When all is said and done though, I guess you could see this as at least an action James chooses for himself once he's in possession of all the facts again, rather than an outcome forced on him by a monster attack, which it would be if he had just let Pyramid Head kill him. He reclaims some agency from Pyramid Head and carries out his suicide on his own terms. I suppose if you look at it like that, it just makes this ending even grimmer. The way these endings are achieved is one of the coolest examples of Ludo narrative in the game. To get the leave ending, you have to play like James would want to survive, healing when damaged as much as possible to give the game the sense James wants to live. Act reckless though, keeping James at low health, and examine the knife you take off Angela, and in general expose James to more grim imagery, and he'll be more likely to end it all at the end. Spend a lot of time with Maria, protecting her more, as well as ignoring Mary's calls for James to stay with her in the hallway at the end, and James will be more likely to leave town with Maria. I think the requirements for getting the Maria ending versus the leave ending are quite cool. It would make sense that a player that talks to Maria and wants to protect her would have their monkey paw wish granted by leaving the town with her, while a player dedicated to surviving and acting committed to Mary would get the leave ending. The requirements for the in water ending are a bit more iffy though. It's possible that a low skilled player may end up with a little health as a result of just trying their best, but playing poorly. And any player might be keen to scope out all the different memos and examine every item. These things may not be a signifier that the player is self-harming and wants James to do the same. I still think the system is cool though, and much more clever than if, say, the game had dialogue choices or something, to more explicitly offer the player clear diverging points with which to choose their ending. There are also two bonus endings for New Game Plus players, three if you're playing the Platinum or Greatest Hits version of the game, further incentive to replay. Again, if you haven't played the game and still watched up to here, I see no reason to spoil those ones for you. If this video has made you interested in the game, you can go seek them out for yourself. They're more extra fun what-ifs than authentic possible outcomes for James. On New Game Plus, some clues can be found on how to get the different endings, so it's not totally left in the dark for you how to get the others after the first run-through. Multiple run-throughs are something very rewarding to do in SH2. I think it's unlikely you'll have a complete picture of what happened from just one go-around. One cryptic moment that sticks out to me is Angela's news article. The name Orozco is blacked out in it, and I only recall learning her surname from the tombstone found after the article. It's this kind of obtuse stuff that makes replaying SH2 almost required. I don't see this as a total negative, though. SH2 is a fairly short game, and offering up missable bits of story material to be found alongside the different unlockable endings, the extra items, and the rank chasing on repeat runs is a great way to incentivize further playtime and give the title a greater sense of value. There's also hard puzzle mode, which makes a few of the riddles more complex. It's nothing major, but not a bad extra for additional runs. On the flip side, hard combat mode feels clumsily implemented, mostly down to the slapdash boss fights. For the most part, hard combat mode does a little to make the survival elements of the game a bit more pronounced while exploring the levels. You'll be using up a lot more resources to stay alive, but the bosses have just been given ridiculous life pools, especially the final ones. On top of that, they've been made faster, making it close to impossible to use your slower, strongest weapons on them without taking damage yourself. 
Using melee items for bosses is barely an option now because they do hardly any damage, aside from the Great Knife, which is again, too slow to use without getting hit. With this extra speed and health, the bosses don't seem designed anymore in a way that they could be plausibly beaten without taking any damage yourself, which reduces your chances of coming out on top basically down to zero if you happen to be hanging in there by a thread. Health items are practically obligatory to beat the final bosses on the harder difficulty, you're just gonna have to drip feed. Which perhaps was what they were going for, but I think any situation in a horror game, especially one with points of no return and limited resources, should be beatable without taking damage or spending insane amounts of time on one encounter, so as to always offer hard-earned comebacks. The developers seem to be aware that without enough kit on hard combat mode, the final boss may just simply be impossible at that point, and added a safety net wherein the boss will die on its own if left for long enough when your ammo runs dry. Again, this all feels clumsy. The final boss in SH1 had the same feature, which wasn't ideal, but at least there it was a final boss that required ammo for you to even deal damage. You can hit the final boss of two with the compulsory first melee weapon, but on hard it would be such a near impossible task to beat with this alone, the devs don't really consider you'll even try that. I'm all for Silent Hill 2 dialing back on some mechanical complexities compared to other games in the horror genre to cater to an experience with different goals. But I don't think that's an excuse for boss fights that on the whole fail to live up to such basic scrutiny. I'm going pretty hard on the bosses, harder than I went on the ones in one. But with this being a sequel and on a whole new platform, some progress in regards to how these fights are handled would have been nice. Especially when, from a visual design standpoint, in my opinion, most of these boss confrontations don't even look as cool as the ones in one. I think that we could have had Silent Hill 2 be the otherwise great experience it is, while having some better bosses. Now though, it's time to take a look at the bigger picture, and at what exactly Silent Hill 2 is, and how successful it is at being what it wants to be. I think something that generally goes unexplored about Silent Hill 2 is that it's Silent Hill 2. And when we get down to things, that's a big part of what makes it special. I think one of the greatest aspects of Silent Hill 2 is that as the sequel to Silent Hill 1, its revelations hit harder and subvert the player's expectations in a daring, exciting, mind-bending way. Silent Hill 1 was a game about playing as an all-around, stand-up guy, stopping a cult, birthing an evil god, and it's fair to expect something similar when entering the second game. That there will be a villain to stop who's instigating the town of Silent Hill to become this hellhole full of monsters. When you start the game, it could easily be assumed that someone in the town sent a letter impersonating Mary to lure James in for unknown reasons, a ritual or master plan. James has been to Silent Hill before, perhaps he got involved in something back then that's come back to bite. There's an expectation that like the first game, SH2 would be about another heroic guy going into a town to stop someone from creating monsters and a nightmare world. But this never comes to pass. Instead, as you go through the game, it slowly unravels that there is no grand scheme at play here, orchestrated by any person at least, and you're essentially taking James Sunderland on a journey of self-reflection through his own mistakes. The powers of the town working now in different, much more esoteric ways, which we'll get into a little bit later. The way this is all slowly unraveled until James learns the truth, I think is paced superbly. But this time the world of Silent Hill is morphing and contorting based on the player characters' inner thoughts and not just somebody else's. You're probably gonna slowly start thinking something is off about SH2 until finally it all comes together. While the nature of the town itself and how its powers operate are still kinda hard to figure out, like in Silent Hill 1, maybe even more so with some of the fiddling it does to how the supernatural elements work now, the emotional beats of the story are much easier to follow along with and in larger supply. So even if you're not completely understanding all the subplots or imagery, you're likely to still get invested in the characters and affecting human drama, which probably does give the game wider mainstream appeal. Once you discover the truth, you can start reflecting on the subtler hints that Silent Hill is manifesting James's own personal trauma. You may have your suspicions 
actions throughout the game, but I think it's the Pyramid Heads fight that really solidifies things. Of course, Silent Hill 1 manifested Alessa's memories, so there is a certain expectation that this will happen to a character in 2. But for it to be the guy you're playing as is quite the shock, and it's satisfying when it all comes together and you realize it. Outside of Pyramid Head, the monsters present very female body structures, and Pyramid Head's behavior towards them becomes even more twisted when you start realizing the town is putting James's subconscious out on display. Of course, you also come to realize the town is doing this for the other characters who have committed some kind of sin, with hints like the tombstones and the plaques in the prison, each one corresponding to one of these three guilty characters that then have to be placed onto a gallows with three nooses. The kind of imagery we see around those characters then comes into clearer focus as representing part of their inner psyche or their baggage. It can even be speculated that the door monster is a manifestation of Angela's and not James's nightmares. Since I can't imagine that the game isn't trying to signal this by having it first appear to her before it appears to James. Angela serves as quite a cool misdirect for the story. If you go into the game assuming someone is going to have their nightmares wandering around like Alessa did in Silent Hill 1, you could make the assumption all the monsters are Angela's. After all, they fit a theme of sexual abuse about as well as they do James's frustration towards his dying wife or the guilt he feels. To have it revealed that it's the quiet guy mourning his wife who's manifesting this stuff and not the outwardly disturbed Angela could serve as one of the game's best hidden twists if you've played one. And familiar with the mechanics of that game's story. If you see Mary's dress and you recognize it as hers, you may think you're gonna find out Mary is birthing the god this time or something, and that this is all a manifestation of her nightmare, the way it was Alessa's in the original. But it ain't. I think it's a shame people tend to sell Silent Hill 2 to others these days as that game where the monsters are your characters' inner demons, because I think it undermines some of the fun of figuring it out yourself. Keep in mind that this wasn't a twist sold to you on the back of the box of Silent Hill 2 when it came out. The behind the scenes video in the European version comes off as something you're meant to watch after playing the game. Playing Silent Hill 1 and 2 back to back makes the twist even more shocking. Knowing A, that in Silent Hill 1 the town can manifest someone's subconscious into reality, but B, having no idea who it's gonna be and then finding out it's the player character, I think is one of the greatest parts of this twist. And I really like the twist, it allows the game to explore these themes of guilt and loss, hijacking one of Silent Hill 1's quirks to tell these painful stories through haunting imagery. That said, I don't think it's the be-all and end-all of what makes SH2 special. It's a part of it, a great part of it, like how the discovery about Alessa projecting her subconscious onto reality was in the first game. A little more potent here because it's so unexpected who's projecting this time, but I think pinning all the success of Silent Hill 2 on this twist would be misguided. Because how much does it help when making the horror more affecting? I suppose like with Pyramid Head's actions, it recontextualizes realizes some things in a more macabre way. But does it make playing the game scarier on your first time through? Well, I don't think you can say it does, because the twist happens near the end. While there's reason to have suspicion up to that point, it's not a sure thing. There's of course something to be said for the emotional reaction you may have to all the different imagery wafting over you before you understand its implications, or before knowing it may have implications at all. But those implications could relate to a myriad of things and still be spooky in the moment. They could have nothing to do with James and that mysterious edge would still make them horrifying. And I think we know that because Angela's monsters are pretty scary too. But I think the game is mainly scary before you know the twist that your guy is getting his angst spat back out at him, because it's a well-designed horror game about delving deeper and deeper into the twisted and the macabre. The twisted and the macabre being things that are generally spookier without a spelled out answer, about what things mean. And Silent Hill 2 does know this, all the way up through the end where the hints are at their most overt. The concept that these monsters are a manifestation of James's psyche isn't something the game explicitly announces. Colonel Campbell doesn't ring you up via codec to let you know James is being psychologically analyzed. Remember, Silent Hill 2's horror is about getting you stressed out about what could be the unknown. The possibility of what's next can be more frightening than what you actually encounter. 
and I think the monsters are supposed to work in a similar fashion. Wondering what the hell are these monsters doing and why is scarier on your first viewing than seeing the same thing with some concrete answer as to why they're behaving like they do. James literally owns Pyramid Head by figuring out what it is, and that's what shuts it down. Letting you in on the truth about Mary's death and hinting further towards the nature of the game's symbolism at the end makes you look back on the whole thing and go, oh, damn. It's a cool twist, but saying it's the single aspects that make Silent Hill 2 great wouldn't be accurate, I think, and does a disservice to the first title, which managed to be unsettling without the protagonist projecting their inner demons switch up. Of course, if a horror game could take a player's real-life trauma and project it into the title as imagery, then yeah, that would probably make things significantly more scary than if it was anyone else's trauma. But that's the thing. I, the player, am not James Sunderland, the same way I'm not Alessa or Eddie or Angela. So ultimately, while it's a cool surprise the player character this time is manifesting the nightmare, it's still not my, the player's nightmare. They're still nightmares based on a character in a game's backstory, and when I'm playing for the bulk of things, I don't even know they are. Trying to speak for everybody on the whole here, I mean, specifically for me, Silent Hill 2 has almost created my nightmare, which is trying to stitch this video together. In general, when it comes to the imagery, but especially in regard to the monsters, I don't think picking the point of view character as the one with which to derive Silent Hill's nightmares, and again, especially its creatures from, intrinsically makes it a more potent experience. Of course, the intention an artist like Masahiro Ito has for what they want their creation to mean is a big part of why they look and act the way they do. So we can, in part, credit how scary these monsters are to the ideas that are trying to be conveyed through them. But they'd evoke those same ideas whether James Sunderland was the playable character or not. The monsters would work on this level just as well as the walking trauma, regret, and guilt of some misunderstood NPC, like a lesson in one. Also, while cool, let's just just take a minute to question how much of this game these monster allegories even play a part in. Notice how much footage I'm having to reuse to talk about monster designs being manifestations of a character's inner trauma. That's because, as discussed, enemy variety is extremely low. Not counting the bugs, the bosses except for Pyramid Head, or the weirdo things on the grates I pretty much just ignored, there's only five types of enemies you stand a chance of encountering in the environment. The aforementioned Pyramid Head, the straight jackets, the mannequins, the nurses, and the door things, the latter of which likely intended to be an Angela monster. Like I mentioned at the start of the video, the game handles this well early on, preying on your imagination without having to actually throw out a huge variety of enemies and threats to kill you. For all you know, anything could still show up until the credits roll. Yeah, a few more enemy types probably wouldn't have hurt, but the bigger point I'm trying to make here is that the novelty of the enemies representing James's thoughts factors into the moment-to-moment -moment game fairly little when you consider how few unique examples of it there are. Of course, while I don't think this protagonist projection quirk is essential to the horror of Silent Hill, the story does make good use of it here and there for more than just the twist being shocking. One good example is Maria being conjured from the protagonist's desires lets us spend time with her as the player, allowing us to explore their dynamic and by extension James's and Mary's dynamic more in depth offering broader context about James's past through their interactions and through gameplay, the possible Maria ending being a way in which the game actually does analyze the player's actions and desires to some degree. You do get to experience James's guilt by being pursued by Pyramid Head firsthand, but I don't think that's the most genius allegory for self-flagellation a game can do, having a monster in a horror title chase you. But yeah, it's certainly a nice little contextual addition to the pursuer trope in this game. In summary though, when it comes to the straight up monsters at least and the core horror gameplay, I think in the process of playing the game, I'm more scared of a monster because it can kill and because it's a scary looking monster, with usually a well-timed appearance in a scary, claustrophobic place. Not as much because it represents a game character's frustrated libido, a fact I don't even know at the time of my first run through, though that part is fun to think about after it's all said and done. I'm totally open to the use of Silent Hill for the exploration 
exploration of a variety of characters' backgrounds. I think the twist here that one of them is the guy you're playing as is also good. All this to say that if you go into Silent Hill 2 after Silent Hill 1 fresh with no preconceptions, you get one hell of a horror game with so many complexities to explore and figure out. How things are presented to you in the game make it an exceptionally rewarding journey, but the package and its qualities are holistic in nature, just like Silent Hill 1. There's no one element that makes Silent Hill 2 amazing. The gameplay, pacing, level design, story and narrative twists, and your prior expectations all come together to form this phenomenal experience. I think it's worth pointing out, though, that the game did have to smudge and recontextualize the events of Silent Hill 1 a bit to make its twists work within the context of Silent Hill as a series. In Silent Hill 1, I got the impression that we were seeing Alessa's subconscious because the evil god was literally being birthed within her. And as the evil emanated from the god, it also projected her nightmarish thoughts as a byproduct. So why, with no god and no incubator for a god, is Silent Hill still projecting nightmares? Well, originally I thought there was more stuff in Silent Hill 1 indicating that Silent Hill has always been a mystical place and by proxy a great place to birth an evil god. I I suppose you could extrapolate that from Silent Hill 1, but really all SH1 really says is there's been a lot of cultists around for a while, and they've always acted kinda weird. So I think just going off SH1, a summation of that game's events would be, a cult that just so happened to be in this random town of Silent Hill, could have been any town, tried to birth a god, and that alone is what caused the events of that game to happen. Town goes to hell, everyone's in danger, and Harry murks the god after it's born so it can't go wild. It's really Silent Hill 2 that tries to go all in and explicitly say the town has always been a centre of otherworldly energies even before the events of SH1. This whole area used to be a sacred place. Sort of amplifying SH1's assertion of there being a history of cultism in Silent Hill to a much larger one, involving the town being subject to various spooky happenings dating back almost a hundred years. Rather than the cult birthing the powers of the town, it's more the other way around, according to Two. Silent Hill 2 more asserts that there's cultists in Silent Hill because it has a history of being a supernatural place to begin with, and probably therefore a good location to try to birth a deity of ill intent. So the way Silent Hill 2 now frames things, if you're in Silent Hill and you try and birth a demon god, the spiritual power is going to create a singular big nightmare that everyone experiences. It's going to destroy the town and make parasites that corrupt people, etc. Take over the world stuff. But if you aren't trying to birth a demon god in Silent Hill, there's energy in the town that will go on auto, showing itself only to people with some kind of sin. And the nightmare that will be projected onto the world will be derived from their subconscious. Whether this auto mode could happen before the attempts to birth the god in SH1 is a bit unclear, but one very cryptic memo found in the game indicates the god may in fact enjoy messing with people and feeding off the pain of others. So perhaps while the physical form of the god was killed by Harry Mason, the power of the town, at least at the time of Silent Hill 2, is still operating under some kind of will of the dark god. This town called you too! You and me are the same! If you look at it from the perspective that the god's will is still involved, then I guess you can say James kinda owned the god by telling SH to get stuffed and or taking home a Silent Hill monster as his new perfect wife. But I guess in the case of that specific ending, Silent Hill does get the last laugh. Maybe the god still being involved works better than the town just being some ambivalent force that just lures people in at random and auto-generates monsters based on their trauma. It could be another reason Pyramid Head lets James keep going at certain points. The god thinks this guy still has some kick in him and wants to use James to harvest more agony energy or something. Now these are the kind of technical story questions a lot of people who play Silent Hill 2 don't even care to think about. They're absorbed in the emotions of the story and feel like the self-contained journey of the characters is more important than how the town works or how it works in relation to game one. And honestly, yeah, I do value those things more in the case of Silent Hill 2, but I think I'm within my rights to ask these questions. The story SH2 tells about James and the others is so good and surprising, I think at the end of the day it's worth altering the context of SH1 just a little bit to get there. And of course the last thing the story needs is mountains of info explicitly explaining the mechanics of the powers of Silent Hill. Ambiguity is at the core of Silent Hill 2, it's at the core of James's motivation, it's at the core of the 
backstory of all the characters and whether what they did was just. It's at the core of the look and behavior of the monsters, the layout of the environments, and what makes it all scary. And to an extent, it should be a factor in the mechanics of the town and the power it emanates. But I think this lack of anything approaching an explanation for how the town is working now is a reason why some people, and especially people who have only played two and only take it into account, start getting so lost as to what is happening and start coming up with crazy theories the game is just about a bunch of crazy people running around a town hallucinating monsters. Of course, every Silent Hill has a little wink to throw you off and make you maybe consider some crazy it's all a dream type explanation. But I don't think a tiny elbow nudge used to make you question yourself for a moment is worth us throwing the entire rest of the game in a bin. I find theories that posit the game takes place inside the character's mind kind of defeat the point of the game. Because, I don't know, your subconscious projecting your subconscious into your subconscious in some kind of esoteric way with unclear consequences is not really quite as big a deal as it actually coming out into reality. What's the point of Silent Hill at all if it amounts to the same thing as having a nightmare in bed at home? But such theories also feel misguided because this is still Silent Hill 2. It's still a sequel to a game about stopping a cult from summoning a god. That game has very little to imply this is all some fantasy outside of the bad ending, where Harry died in the car at the start. And that's the bad ending, more of a bonus what if, if anything. However, I think you can't entirely pin weirdo interpretations on just people's imaginations. We're talking about a game that gives backstory on why the town works the way it does by dropping poetic memos to decipher that can only be found on New Game Plus. Well damn, now they got me wondering if the hidden New Game Plus ending involving these secret items is supposed to indicate that playthrough is the true Silent Hill 1 follow-up timeline. Get me out of this can of worms, ladies and gentlemen. Like with Game 1, putting the history and lore together is fun, but perhaps what's there to piece together is missing just a smidge more context. A game not letting you in on some of the basic reasons the world operates how it does until New Game Plus is pretty hardcore though. Gotta respect that goal on some level. No matter how you view all of this though, I think it's hard not to respect Silent Hill 2 for being so daring. It takes the kind of chance a direct sequel rarely takes and I think handles it with class, offering up a breadth of surprising cool ideas for an exploratory horror game to implement. The characters are more complex than the first game and the way the story builds and hints towards its twist is a wonderful breadcrumb trail I wish I could relive for a first time again. As a complete package though, I think sometimes the quality can be a bit more sporadic than the first game. Which which stands tall as this tight original explosion of creativity that you can look at from almost every angle and be surprised by and impressed with. Silent Hill 2 has some higher peaks than 1, but I think as an overall experience, 1 is more consistent. I do feel like SH2 veers pretty wildly from moments where I'm thinking, whoa, this is like the peak of the genre, to others where I'm like, wow, this is some of the corniest, silliest stuff I've seen. I think in its attempt to really just go all out with crazy new ideas, SH2 has a few moments that don't entirely hit the mark. And while the twist the game hits you with is superbly executed from a pacing standpoint, it did probably muddy what was already a pretty hard series of events to piece together from one, looking at the games now as a duology. I guess some might say there was paranormal spooky stuff in the first game, so there can be any kind of weird spooky paranormal stuff in the next game. I feel like when you start throwing all rules out the window, that's when things can get a little messy and I start being less invested in the trials the characters are going through. If it all can turn out to just be random nonsense. And to be fair to Silent Hill 2, it doesn't really do that. It tweaks and alters a few things from one, but it doesn't go completely off the rails or anything. Things still remain fairly consistent across the two games, thanks to those tweaks. And once more, I am of the mind that it was worth it. The severe change in premise allows the game to deal with more adult subject matter than SH1. Like guilt, relationships, loss, and abuse, which lends it a unique series of topics to tackle for a mainstream 2001 game. Especially compared to other horror games of the time focused more on the adventure and the story the characters are caught up in. In SH2, the drama is laser focused on the characters themselves and diving deep into their nuances, thoughts, and feelings. With all the different endings, it can be hard to exactly determine what SH2 is trying to say at the end of the day. But considering the in water and Maria endings, and even the secret non joke ending, are presented as negative or dubiously happy outcomes, I think what we can take away from Silent Hill 2 is that you have to face grief and loss and guilt head on. You can't try and ignore them, or worse, try and fill the hole they're leaving or have left by repeating yourself and making similar mistakes or indulging in fantasy to ignore reality. But I can be yours. 
I'll be here for you forever. And I'll never yell at you or make you feel bad. That's what you wanted. You have to learn to be happy without dependency. You have to learn to find happiness within and not completely depend on others, in case who or what you rely on gets pulled out from under you. I told you to go. Are you deaf? Don't come back. If you're not prepared for these kind of events on some level, it leaves you vulnerable and poised to make bad decisions. Whether those decisions were justified or selfish, wallowing in the guilt solves nothing, even if you might deserve to. The leave ending shows the positive outcomes of getting it right, facing your mistakes and moving forward. The truth is, I hated you. I wanted you out of the way. I wanted my life back. If that were true, then why do you look so sad? And the In Water and Maria endings show what happens when you get it wrong and succumb to your pain, fantasies, and base desires. How to best manage dependencies in a healthy way is what Silent Hill 2 leaves you thinking about the most, I think. Coming to terms with grief and trying to find a positive avenue to move on through. The soundtrack is one of the best in a game of its kind, better than the original. The artists won the top of their game, creating one of the most visually striking titles in the business. Even though it's a grayer, grimmer take on Silent Hill that perhaps doesn't hold up in my mind quite as well as the confident, vivid look of the first game, the details are more exquisite than ever. It's hard to play Silent Hill 2 and not get caught up in its world and the story it tells, which means I can only call it a success, and with all its other great attributes taken into account, like the first game, it's one of the most remarkable titles of its generation. And just like the first game, one of my personal favorites ever. It's one of gaming's ultimate treks into darkness and the abyss. With an entire previous game to slowly reveal its subverting, there aren't many other titles that live up to its level of discovery and mystery. Providing such a compelling descent into the unknown, where expectations get completely defied to this extent on the macro level of the story and the plot twists and what the game is ultimately even about, while on a micro level offering incredible details detail and diverse moment-to-moment -moment surprises while playing that make opening each new door an exciting, thrilling, and rewarding prospect. So when the biggest brushstrokes to the tiniest dabs have something to marvel at, well, you get a bit of a classic, right? A horror game classic, like Silent Hill 2. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this analysis. If you want to see more Silent Hill content on this channel, please consider pledging over on the Patreon. Click the link on screen or head to patreon.com slash thegamingbritshow. A big thanks goes out to all my top backers you're seeing scrolling by right now. Until next time.